Okay, it is four o'clock, so I will call to order the uh, October, what? I can't remember the month. October um, meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And Kim, could we start with the roll call, please? Kathleen Mills. Here. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Here. Jim Whitlatch. Here. Okay, we do have all four members here. Um, so we actually start with our consent calendar. Um, all is one motion, so this includes the minutes from the September meeting, claims submitted, business reports, surplus, and then some smaller contract addendums or partnership agreements um, that we've had a chance to look over for a few days now. So do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Okay. And all those in favor, roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion unanimously carried. And then we'll move into our section B, um, the public hearings and appearances. And we have a Bravo Award today that Emily Book will tell us about. Yes. Hello everyone, Emily Boot, Community Relations Coordinator. Uh, we would like to recognize Don Singh. She's not here today, she had a class, uh, but we'd like to recognize her with the Octo October Bravo Award. So Don is a senior at Indiana University studying community health in the School of Public Health. Throughout September and October, she has volunteered her time at multiple community events. Uh, she stayed a little beyond her shift at Glow in the Park to provide an extra helping hand with cleaning due to the limited number of volunteers and was very critical to the management of that event. She also volunteered at the welcome table at Bugfest, which saw a record number of attendees and was considered by many to be the most successful yet. Uh, finally, Don has already registered also to help us out bring the haunted house to life at Frank Southern for Skate and Scare coming up on October 29th. Uh, Don's help has been instrumental in the success of all of these events, and we thank her for her time and commitment to our department and the community. Okay. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Emily. Um, okay. Certainly couldn't do all of this without volunteers, so we always appreciate them. And next up is our Parks Partner Award, which this month is going to Green Hat Media. And Julie will tell us about that. Good afternoon. Julie Ramey, Community Relations Manager. Bloomington Parks and Recreation would like to recognize Green Hat Media as the recipient of this quarter's Parks Partner Award. The Parks Partner Award is a component of our sponsorship program and it recognizes our most outstanding community partners. Garrett Portinga is here with us today. He founded Green Hat Media in 2014 and he runs Green Hat Media as the primary photographer and video producer. Green Hat Media provides a variety of photography and videography services to the community and first sponsored Glow in the Park for Parks and Recreation in 2018. We have also hired Garrett to photograph significant events where professional expertise is desired, including the grand opening of Switchyard Park that took place in the pavilion in 2019. So Garrett says that when he was first approached about sponsorship for Glow in the Park, it was a brand new event. It was an exciting new idea and in line with a lot of my experience as a young photographer. I personally love covering music events and dance parties. Also at the time, Garrett's family and friends had kids in the age range for enjoying the event, so he knew he'd look forward to bringing them to the event as well. Each year, the event gets more and more fun and more people are attending. I love that the Parks Department has expanded it to a series of three events and looks forward to continuing to support this event and parks every year. And now he also has a chance to bring his own children to the next Glow in the Park event. So Green Hat Media sponsored the entire Glow series of events in 2022, which included Glow in the Dark Scavenger Hunt, the Splash and Glow Party, and Glow in the Park, and is already committed to sponsoring Glow events in 2023. We are so grateful to Garrett Portinga and to Green Hat Media for his support, and Bloomington Parks and Recreation is proud to recognize Garrett with the Parks Partner Award. I'd like to come up and receive your award. I would just say um, thank you to Julie, um, to Paula, and to the whole board uh, for putting on such amazing parks events such as the GLOW series. Um, it just makes being a business here in Bloomington an opportunity to give back to the people and make Bloomington an awesome place to live. So thank you all very much.
Yeah. Thank you for your sponsorship. Thank yes. You. And your photos. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's Thank, a lot you. Of fun. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, and then uh, we have some staff introductions. First up is Morgan Wood. Hello, I'm Morgan Wood. I'm a freshman at IU Bloomington, and I'm a Cox Scholar. My major is Intelligent Systems Engineering with a concentration in Cyber-Physical Systems, and I'll be helping the Parks Department with data management for approximately 10 hours a week. Nice to meet you all. Okay, nice to meet you. Can you prevent everyone here in the room from being attacked, cyber attacked? <laughs> okay. Get yeah. In a, in a, right, in a few semesters. Okay. And Jake Wood, Natural Resources. Hey, everyone. My name is Jake Wood. Uh, I'm the Natural Resources intern this semester. I'm a senior at IU studying outdoor recreation. Uh, I've worked for parks doing seasonal positions the past two years, uh, Zamboni driver at Frank Southern, park services at Switchyard, labor at Switchyard, park specialist at seminary uh, for community events. Um, super excited to be working with parks and furthering my career. Uh, just left Nature Days this morning, so facilitated my first lesson at Leonard Springs. Lots of fun. So nice to meet you guys. Nice. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Worked on every property. Yeah, everything. Yeah. And then Thomas Scarer. 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 Okay. There's no way to say it wrong. I mean, okay. <laughs> what, what, what does it matter? So, uh, yeah, hi, my name is Thomas Scare. I am currently pursuing a MPA from the O'Neill School of Public Environmental Affairs. I'm in my first year of uh, doing that with a concentration in state and local government. Very excited to be here. Uh, I'm originally from Fort Wayne. I did my undergrad at Ball State. And uh, now that I'm here, I'm primarily working under Steve Cotter, assisting the Parks and Rec operations for about uh, 12 hours a week. So very nice to meet you all. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. Welcome. OK, all right, and then we will move into Section C, Other Business. And first up, Tem Street will tell us about the uh, contract with Mater Design for Griffey Dam Crossing Construction Administration. Yes, good evening, Park Commissioners. Tim Street, Operations and Development Division Director for Parks. Uh, happy to come before you tonight with a contract with Mater Design in the amount of $12,500 um, that will be funded through uh, TIF funds approved through the, through the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission. Uh, that funding was actually approved at last night's RDC meeting. Um, so that step is completed. And now to finalize the contract, we need the Board of Park Commissioners approval. Uh, what this contract will do is Mater Design will provide construction administration, uh, bid doc preparation, engineering services, et cetera, uh, for the Griffey Dam trail crossing project. Uh, and just a general reminder with the Griffey project, we, we have three phases basically happening with that project. The first phase we completed, uh, which was the trail crossing on the east side and the pilot project of trail on the south shore. Um, this will second, essentially be the second phase. Um, we hope to bid this this winter uh, and construct this next year, uh, which will take care of the safe dam crossing. Uh, and then we will use the remaining bicentennial bond funds next year uh, once the master plan for the trail is delivered later this year uh, to construct as many improvements and the best improvements we can uh, to complete that approximate six mile loop. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Tim? No? I'll move to approve uh, the contract with Mater Designs for the Griffey Dam Crossing Construction Administration. Second. Okay, and a roll call vote, please. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Motion carried. And then it is, of course, always time for tree pruning or removal. So Haskell Smith will tell us about this contract with Bluestone Tree. Hello, all. Haskell Smith, Urban Forester. Um, I recommend the approval of a contract with Bluestone for approximately 40 mature pin oak prunings along East Winston Drive. Um, in the amount of $24,375 coming from the 399 line. Um, it's one of the worst areas in Bloomington for mature pin oak droop into our roadways. Uh, 
uh, this will alleviate all of the issues <clears throat> 14 feet from the street and eight foot above sidewalks. Okay. All right. Um, so this is removing, yeah, dead and dying branches and then clearance, as you said. All right. Any questions for Haskell about this one? I'll move to approve uh, the contract with Bluestone for tree pruning on Winston. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, motion is carried. And then Haskell will also tell us about another contract with Bluestone for calorie pear tree removal and tree planting. Uh, we <clears throat> have another contract with Bluestone for removal and replacement 11 calorie pairs along B line between 3rd Street and Kirkwood. Uh, the contract amount not to exceed $17,523. Uh, the funding source will come from two separate funds, the 399 and uh, bicentennial tree planting funds. Okay. And this is part of the continuing effort to remove invasive species. It right? is. Yeah. I know I've been reading about across the country, everybody, their, their former love affair with the calorie pair, but now they don't want it anymore. Yeah. Yep, it's on its way out. We uh, hope to work to, with uh, community relations and posting more information, campaign before, during, and after, kind of letting everybody know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay, yeah, that's good. Any yeah. questions about this contract? Were there trees being, re are they being replaced with something? Ten of them will be replaced with uh, native species of varying small to medium sizes, yellowwood, hop hornbeam, stuff in that area. I think coffee tree was one of them. And when will that occur? Uh, 30 days after approval of contract is what they had told me. So mid to late November. Okay. All right, thanks. All right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll move to approve the contract with Bluestone for calorie pear tree removal and replacement. Second. Okay. And a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay. Motion is carried. All right. Thank you, Haskell. Thank you all. And then Leslie Brenson will tell us about the contract with Winterland Incorporated for holiday light displays at Switchyard. Good afternoon, Leslie Brinson, the Community Events Manager. I'm here today to ask approval of a service contract with Winterland, Inc. for the rental of light-up structures for our Winter Lights December Nights event. The contract will not exceed $9,000 and will be paid out of our non-reverting account. The Parks Department will be hosting the second Winter Lights December Nights on Saturday, December 3rd at Switchyard Park. During the event, Winterland will provide the delivery, setup, and takedown of standalone light fixtures to be displayed uh, around the park. These lights will actually remain in the park for the entire month of December. The department will rent several standalone light displays from Winterland and we are purchasing, uh, we actually were able to purchase two displays um, this year after some additional sponsorship money. And um, we worked with the same department in 2021 and really appreciated their um, flexibility, their willingness to come work with us. And one of the few companies in Indiana that actually rents the light displays as opposed to making you purchase them. So um, this year the uh, theme is Candyland. So if you look on the bottom um, picture there, we're not renting all of those on that, on that picture, but the gingerbread house on the upper left, um, yeah, there, and then the two on the bottom right, the ones on, yeah, the trampoline and then the balancing one. And then we have some additional um, penguins and um, a couple of other gingerbread and candy cane type structures. And then the picture with this, the polar bear up on the other corner is one of the per ones we are purchasing. So it's um, a photo opportunity where people could put their face in the light up and then we're also going to purchase a seven foot snowman, which would be a similar kind of, exp uh, obviously seven foot, you wouldn't be able to put your face in, but you get the gist. Uh, a snowman um, uh, that would be a similar kind of experience. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
I'm just wondering, because I, I do remember us doing this last year too. With and since you're saying they're staying up, is there any? Have there been any problems with vandalism of them or anything? We did not have any last year, and we were blessed with really great weather. We learned a lot, and uh, the staff at Switchyard have also learned a lot. So we're purchasing some different things to help with the cords and the electrical piece of it. But um, you know, last year they were only up for about four or five days. So uh, you know, fingers crossed. And keep Hope for the best for the whole month, but I think there'll be much more. Um, it'd be a better use of the funds for people to be able to see them all month, and it will help bring people to the park during the month of December. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? For if they the are vandalized, and since we're renting them, how does that work? Do you know? Yeah, there's a part in the contract that talks about. You know, I think it depends on how bad you're talking. Do they just get pushed over? Do the light bulbs get busted? Uh, you know, they're pretty hardy. They're made to be out in places and, and stay for long periods of time. So they're built pretty um, dependable, but certainly there is a, a piece of that depending on what the vandalism is that we'll have to work through. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, any other questions for Leslie or? No, no. I'm just okay. excited that this is growing. So, I will move to approve the contract with Winterland Inc. for holiday light displays at Switcher Park. Second. Okay, and a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Radke. Aye. Israel Herrera. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right. Motion's carried. Thank you, Leslie. And then C5, Steve Cotter will tell us about. Um, partnership agreement with the Academy for Science and Entrepreneurship for <coughs> Butler Park Virtual Tour. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Steve Cotter, Natural Resources Manager. We were approached by the Academy for Science and Entrepreneurship about the possibility of doing a tour at Butler Park. Uh, the tour would focus on the human and natural history of the park, and they will be placing QR codes if they partnership agreement is approved throughout the park that visitors can uh, take a picture of and then be linked to a virtual tour on our outer spatial app. And the head teacher for the project is Anna Oresco. She is here today along with a couple students and one of them has a couple comments. Hello. Sorry. My name is Sydney Young, and I'm a junior at the Academy of Science and Entrepreneurship who's participating in the project. Um, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> sorry. But uh, I think the project is, it's been really beneficial for us as a school, but I think it could also be beneficial to the community as well. Because when they first told us about the project, I did not know that this park was even there, and it was so close to us. So I think even just getting in the park and seeing the signs that were already there already taught us so much. So I feel like this could be extremely beneficial in adding more information, especially about the reverend that the park was named after. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Any questions about this partnership? Okay. Is it, um, sorry, does it okay. say, is it permanent or is it? It will be up for one year. One year. Okay. Yes. All right, I will move to approve the partnership agreement with the Academy for Science and Entrepreneurship for the Butler Tour. Second. And a roll call vote. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. All right, Thank you motion very much. carried. Yeah, sounds like a cool idea. Thanks, Steve. And um, next we will hear a review of the 2023 price schedule from division directors. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Becky Higgins, the Recreation Services D Division Director, and I'm gonna start us off today with changes um, within the Recreation Division. I'm gonna be very broad, so if you have any questions or want me to dig a little deeper, let me know. Um, starting off, we'll start off with the Farmer's Market area first. I'm not, yeah. And really, the, there is no change in cost. It looks a little different because there is one less weekend, and so that then changes the way that we operate. But there is no increase this year with the farmer's market. There is a decrease 
this year in the prepared food, the, um, we are dropping it down to 6.5%. As you recall, a few years ago, we were going to do a effort to balance things a little bit with market and we have raised market prices the last few years so we're going to decrease the prepared foods to 6.5 um, this year in an effort as we continually try to work to to make those a little bit more even in, in scope so that's what we're doing with this year. Um, Becky can I just add is I remember this conversation from before. Is there a goal to eventually get it to something around 5%? 5% is the goal, but we okay. have never said when that will happen because it very much depends on um, cost recovery and, and how things work. So some years there may be a decrease and some years there may not. Okay, thank you. And then moving on under gardens, you'll see an increase in plots of $5. We have continued to sell out of garden spaces, so that we feel is a good move. And then under um, Waldron Hill and Buzzkirk Park, the stage, we are changing the price just a little bit. It's, it's a small increase um, as that park becomes back into use and you know it, it's funny we haven't since we've renovated and with all the pavers and everything we've yet to really get to use it because of the big dig project so next year will be the first year so we're excited about that and then affair of the arts an increase in application and booth spaces one of the things that you'll see in the booth spaces that used to be a range and that was because we would hold it at showers or we would hold it at the Tuesday market and we're not going to hold it at Tuesday market anymore. It'll go back to showers. So while there is still an increase, there is also no longer a range since it will be held here. Um, same with the holiday market, um, booth space increase of $5. And then with the mobile stage rental, that hasn't been increased in a, in a very long time, and so that's just, you're seeing an increase of about $25. And then some wording changes. The platforms, another increase of $10, and you'll see something that's been removed, which were the risers, which was the small stage that is now housed at the, pavi at the pavilion in Switchard Park. So we've not seen a need for that with outside rentals, so we're pulling that off, and it'll be used mostly at the pavilion and then for our own programs. There is a change in Switchard Park, and what you'll see basically is a change, a twofold. There is, a, there is an increase, but there is also a change in the way that we're doing the fees. As we live through this, we are learning more and more about better ways to actually organize our rentals at that park. And the pavilion is very popular. I think when I talked to Sean last week, he said for 2023, there's only five Saturdays left open. So it's still a very, very popular rental. And what we're doing is moving, we tried a four hour time block at a certain price. We're going to an hourly fee with a minimum of four hours rental. Um, and then on weekends, a six hour minimum rental. We find that that um, we think will be more specific to customers so that a lot of times they would rent it for the morning but and so we would be there at 8 a.m. with staff but they may not come till 10. You know so so we're trying to hone in and and reduce um, the need for staff if we don't you know when there's nothing for them to do. So that's the big change there. Um, the added alcohol fees section is just a wording change. Um, we've also seen that using that patio right outside of the pavilion has become very popular and we want to continue to do that. The next big change, which really isn't very big, um, the performance stage 
the lawns, the way that we refer to them, they're just being referred and classified a little differently, but the fees remain the same. And then really lastly is Kids City, and Kids City shows an increase for break days from 40 to $45, and I just wanna point out that actually won't start until the second half of 2023 because we operate on the school year for that. So we'll keep this school year the same, and then when it starts in the fall for next school year, it will be increased $5. And really, that's it for my area. I'm happy to answer any questions or give any more details if you need it. Okay. Thank you, Becky. Okay, great. Next. Good afternoon, Kido from Sports Division. Uh, I'd like to ask some decrease and increase in the uh, price. Uh, first of all, uh, this is going to be the, probably the decrease you hear from me today, only the decrease. Uh, that's going to be an adult softball. We used to charge 720 bucks, but now we're going to decrease that to 675. The reason behind uh, the number of softball participants and teams are declining. Mm -hmm. This is not unique to Bloomington, this is a nationwide. And uh, instead of doing the same thing over and over, we want to change it up a little bit. So decrease the price and see uh, if we can get more teams in. So that's the reason behind we want to decrease the price for softball. Okay, yeah, that that's, was exactly my question, so, and you answered it. The next one is, I believe, page three, uh, adult and youth sports. Uh, the highlight for this page is we are getting a range for the lining the field, uh, 300 to 600. Used to be only for one price for 300, but some of the lining project cost us more than 300, that's what we realized. So, so we want to get range between 300 and 600 so we can uh, accommodate uh, the bill that we are sending and the uh, money we are receiving. Next one is page four. Aquatics, Brian Pool and Mills Pool. We are increasing general admission from $5 to $6. And some of the season pass increase 65 to 70. And uh, economy pass and punch pass will increase 85 to 90. We try to limit probably 5 to 10 percent max. And uh, with our research, are you out that pool uh, is charging six bucks mm -hmm. this year already. So Yeah, I also was just checking around today and noticed a lot of other public pools in Indiana, it seems to be five or six dollars. That's the range. So. Mm -hmm. uh, next one, continue for page five. And uh, aquatics. And this is going to be more for group renting and uh, both playa and the mills pool. As you see, the price increase, again, we try to limit uh, 10 to 15 percent increase for the rent out. Any questions on the page five? Good? No. Okay. Then we're going to go to page 12. Frank Southern Ice Arena. Starting January 1st, we'd like to uh, increase our ice rental time from two, 230 bucks to 240 per hour. That's $10 increase. And page 13, that's going to be a goal of services. And you see lots of list over there. And the highlight of this increase is we compare with uh, local competitors, such as Rolling Meadows, mm -hmm. uh, Stonecrest, mm -hmm. and uh, Eagle Point. And we realized 
comparing with their 2022 fees, we are still in the bottom. So we're going to bring this up, and uh, I assume they're going to bring up the, their price to 2023. And the last one I have is page 17, uh, Twin Lakes Recreation Center. The reason why there's no change for the price is we increased 10 to 15 percent last year. And uh, we feel comfortable keeping that price for upcoming 2023. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, Barb Dunbar, Operations Coordinator. I'm standing in for Tim on this one. He had to excuse himself. Um, okay, I'm gonna start with cemeteries. Um, on page seven, our changes include, with the anticipation of the scatter garden opening next year, um, we needed to in, uh, construct some fees for that. And um, we, I called around, uh, found about at least six others in the state so we could kind of get an idea and see what people were doing. What I had envisioned doing with our scatter garden is, is exactly what a lot of the others are doing. They have one fee for, um, we realized there's no lockable gate on the cemetery, so at any point somebody could come in and just scatter. Of course, they could do that anywhere in the cemetery, of course. But um, if, they, if they just want to scatter cremains, um, that, that will have one fee and then um, of $300. And if they want to do the scattering and have their loved one's name and dates engraved on the memorial stone that would be in the center of that garden, it would be 575 So that was added in there. Other than that, across the board, we've increased everything by $50 for uh, inter interments, disinterments, inurnments, which is cremation and disinurnments um, by $50. And in all of those, any time they arrive after 2 p.m., those fees went up $25. So it was just kind of an across the board kind of thing. And I do want to point out the last fee increase we had for cemeteries was for the year of 2020. So we went several years with the same fee. So we're definitely due for a, a fee increase here with rising costs. Okay. I'm gonna move, do you have any questions about the cemeteries? I'll move on to the next area in our division. Yeah. Okay. Natural resources <laughs> is next. Um, under, on page 14, under launch permits, an annual launch permit, a non-motorized annual launch permit increased from 80 to 90, so just a $10 fee increase there. A second annual, meaning the second purchase of a second annual permit, if they buy a second one, increased from 20 to $25. And the daily permits increase from eight to nine dollars. So, again, some small incremental increases there. Canoe and boat rentals increase per the, the rate per hour increased from eight to nine, and a ten pass uh, increased from seventy to eighty. And that covers our Griffey Lake watercraft operation. And then the edu educational programs, um, we get requests from private groups in the community to have a private instruction with our certified naturalists, and that rate increased from $25 per hour for up to 15 people to $30 per, per hour. So that was it for natural resources. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the final area I'm representing would be operations, and that, that covers our shelter rentals. So we did have, last year, we did have an in incremental increase of just $3 across the board. But we have so many rising costs for that area now. So we did the same thing this year. Again, they went up $3 each shelter. Monday through Thursday is what we call our weekday prices. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is considered weekend pricing. So everything just went up $3. Now, I also call around to a lot of other parks departments uh, when I look at prices every year to see what others are charging. And it is such a range. Um, it kind of depends on the size of the apart department. Uh, departments up in Lake County, which is where I'm from, where you have such a high volume of people in a small area, they are very high because there's such a huge high demand and they charge a lot. So I would say 
if you placed us on a scale in, in the state of Indiana for shelter nurse, we're in the medium, we're in the medium high range of what we charge on our shelters. Okay. Okay. And and there wasn't any decrease in shelter use after that. There was um, three dollars. There we have had some decrease, but we also had one less shelter. We no longer charge for the Switchyard Park shelter, so that represented some decrease in revenue. Right now, for this year, we're at about thirty-six thousand dollars in in shelter revenue. Last year's total was forty-three thousand, so we're not too too far off. Okay. Any questions right. about that? The whole day, yeah, when you rent a shelter, it's all day. But we don't split the day in half. If you have it, it's just for the whole day. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, you said that they've decreased from 2021 to 2022, is that? Tw 20? The total uh, revenue. This year's is down slightly from last year. Okay. And it definitely, uh, they, they went back, they went back up in 21 from 20, of course, right. because of COVID. But um, it, there's still, I mean, well, we, we take shelter rentals till October 31st. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, yeah, there's yeah. a little time. Um, but it's pretty much going to be maybe just under 40,000. Yeah. I would just year. be curious on how that actually compares to pre-pandemic data because in 2021 well, I have the numbers it still, I, yeah yeah it was you know just out of curiosity because you have to be real careful with that hard metal. comparison the old thing we learn in our high school class the elasticity of demand where you have to be very sensitive to the demand oh, yeah. and how the prices reflect that because at some point you cannot price yourself real right easily. absolutely okay yeah, that was good. thank you oh. it's going to be demolished and we will be constructing a new one but that is still kind of, we don't have a, a set date for that to begin yet. So for now, it's, it's off the schedule. Okay. All right. Good. Anything okay. else? All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to jump in here real quick. There was one small thing under administration in miscellaneous advertising range changed from 400 to 30,000 down to 300 to 30,000. So we're just giving a a lower range on our advertising. Okay. Something else was just brought up to me. Very important. Thank you, Mark. We did not have the waterfall shelter for half of the year this year oh, because of all that right. construction. And that is a very popular rental mm -hmm. and it's on the higher end for cost too. So that represents yeah. a slight decrease as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> for sure. Thanks. Steve. All right. Thank you. Th yes. And um, just so uh, Board of Park Commissioners are aware, this is a draft. So certainly look it over. We appreciate your questions this afternoon. If you have any additional questions, please forward that uh, to me and we will get you those answers. And just really across the board, I know it was mentioned by some of the staff, and when I presented our general fund budget, um, our costs have increased in all of our categories, um, our seasonal wages are going up, which is great, but we have to cover those costs as well as supplies and services. So um, really challenge the staff to uh, do exactly what they've done in the research, make sure that we're not outpricing ourselves, but also taking into consideration that our costs have increased. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's the water safety instructor. Okay, and then we will um, close out section C there, move into section D, which is reports. And um, I think before D Tuttle gives us the aquatics report, we'll meet some hockey guests. Yes. Good afternoon, D Tuttle sports facility program manager. I want to jump back up into uh, the consent calendar for a second. Um, we have two of our presidents here of our of two user groups. Um, the first being uh, Nick Kuypers and he is with the Bloomington Blades travel program. Nick. Hey, it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Nick Kuypers. I've been the president of the Bloomington Blades Youth Hockey Association for now my second year, but a member of the organization for about four. Um, I coach, I've got three little kids, eight, six, and four, who all play. 
And just to share a little bit about how our organization works, it's, it's unique uh, relative to other hockey programs in the north and the country where you have hundreds of kids each year who are within the program. We have a smaller program, so to support each other, the city and the travel organization, we've partnered together. And what we do is essentially provide coaches and typically a house program will have enough of their own house only kids to be sustainable as a league by themselves. Since we don't, we integrate those kids with our travel kids and we just coach them like our own. So we've, uh, obviously we have house hockey all the way up to the age of 12. Beyond that, we still have teams that aren't also registered in house. But the incentive for us as an organization is actually financial because uh, we don't pay for that ice. Uh, so we're providing coaches essentially with that back in return. And while our kids do pay their de dues to the city, if we would have compensated that back as fees ourselves to like purchase that ice, for example, it would actually be at a disadvantage to us. So it's a great partnership for us. Uh, we also think it's a phenomenal marketing tactic because the best way to get kids to fall in love with the sport is to give them coaches that really love it. And that's something we've been able to see, the house kids seeing those kids having a, great, a blast out there when they're wearing their blades blue is a lot of fun and we've gotten a lot of new kids that way. So I'm happy to answer any questions and I also want to save time for, for uh, Dan Sizemore behind me. Okay, yeah, thank you. I know Bloomington Blades has a, a very strong following. So awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And we also have Dan Sizemore with us, and he is the president of the Bloomington Blades High School Program. Hey, good afternoon. Um, my name is Dan Sizemore. I'm new to this position this year for the high school program. Um, three of my kids have come through the youth program here in Bloomington, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, the high school program wouldn't be possible without the groundwork that was laid through the youth program. And uh, our numbers are coming up. And, and again, I think uh, there's a, some long history with the Parks Department here. I know the State High School Association is uh, 50th anniversary is this year. So I believe Bloomington has been in that program since it, the beginning, which is one of the only few teams that still left. Uh, we compete against, um, like what he's saying, some of the corporate type hockey um, models, the Indy Fuel. Um, they, they come to Bloomington, they rob our players, uh, just to put it short. Uh, some good hockey players that are coming out of Bloomington. Uh, a couple years ago, they went to the state championship, played against Culver. Uh, we've had three kids. Uh, one of the kids that's local that come through the program, uh, Dash Oliver, played for the United States uh, development team, won the gold medal a couple years ago. Uh, we got two or three kids that's been drafted this in the, over the past two years that have went on to play hockey, hockey outside of high school. So, and again, it it all starts at the grassroots with the parks department. And it's good to see these kids prosper. So, do you guys have any questions? I'd be glad to answer. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Guys. No, thank you. Yep. We appreciate it. I'm glad it's a partnership that's worked out. All right, then Dee will give us the aquatics report. I will. Dee Tuttle, aquatics manager, and I am going to present the aquatics report for 2022. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. So first we'll address the operating season. The operating season for both facilities um, begins on the Saturday of Memorial Day, and this past season was Saturday, May 28th. Bryan Park Pool uh, stays open um, until every day, seven days a week, until we get to the point of MCCSC uh, heading back to school. Uh, and then we go weekends only, which is Friday, or I'm sorry, Saturday and Sunday. Um, and we are open until the Monday of Labor Day. Mills Pool closes on July 31st. We close that facility um, and we uh, let the chemicals kind of trickle away and then we uh, have drill in the pool at Mills two or three days after we close that facility. Daily admissions, we had 20,840 at Bryan Park and over 5,000 at Mills. Our season passes were up to 464 and our economy punch pass 
was down a bit from um, 2021. You'll see that a little on the next slide. Uh, but that was because our season passes were up. Um, and then we had several different camps that attended both facilities. Um, it really increased our revenue at Mills because of the Mackam Group and Girls Incorporated. In 2022, we had 18 private pool rentals at Bryan Park and seven at Mills. That's compared to 25 at Bryan for 2021 and eight at Mills. Our group lessons uh, were consistent with last year. We see the uh, larger numbers, of course, in the lower levels um, where those individuals are just beginning to learn how to swim. Uh, we see that consistently from year to year. Next slide. Employee trainings begin well before pool season. We actually open the pool. Um, it's really time consuming. We do approximately 80 hours of preseason training. Uh, we train bloodborne pathogens. Uh, we, clean, we train on how to clean up the pool if we um, have debris per se in the pool um, during the day in public use. We do general staff training. Um, definitely staffing uh, is a challenge these days across the board. It takes 60 to 70 employees, that's lifeguards, admissions, and concession staff to, um, to run both Bryan and Mills uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and that's probably a little bit low. Ideally, you'd want at least 85 to 90 staff members. We have emergency procedure management training, swim instructor orientation, uh, which means we take our swim instructors and teach them how to teach others. Our, we have customer service training, uh, so those individuals know how to meet and greet our customers as they come through the door and also as they exit the door. Our staff training is very similar to our um, attendant training, our customer service. It's also a customer service area. In-service training during the uh, time that the pools are open, uh, we do approximately 75 hours of in-service training, and that's ongoing training with all of our staff just to make sure that they are up to date on all of their skills. This year, we incorporated a junior lifeguard class. Uh, we only had one individual sign up for that class, um, but it was, uh, it was really, really great to see this young man that was 10 years old um, going through the skills. And actually, his mother sent us an email approximately, I, would, I think probably a couple weeks after he completed the class, um, saying that they were on a family vacation, and he was at the pool and saw someone in trouble, and he actually saved that individual. So uh, we, we were very proud of him for, for doing so, and hopefully he'll be a, a member of our staff as soon as he turns that magical age. And of course, we do spinal injury management and trainings on a regular basis as well, just to make sure that if we do have an injury, that everyone is educated in the correct um, manner to know how to remove that individual from the pool and from the facility. And then, of course, first aid, CPR, and AED um, just goes along with the rest of our trainings. Pool revenue, can't hardly see that at the top, but this is Brian pool revenue. Um, and we did a five-year span here, just so you could see a comparison. Um, so on admissions, uh, this year, we, uh, our revenue was 95,542, and it was a little bit below last year, which is 95,832. And this, this is revenue from those that just pay the daily $5 admission for 2022. Um, the other graph is uh, one that displays our season pass or the 20 punch pass revenue. And so you can see how that the revenue uh, is, our 2022 total revenue is 159,216 that shows um, up here. We do have a, a little bit of additional revenue from private 
rentals, so it did exceed $160,000. But our season pass and punch pass revenue um, was almost $20,000 higher in 2022 at 63,674 than in 2021 at 44,431. Um, so you just you can't guess what those numbers are going to be. It's always just really interesting of who's going to just pay the daily admission fee and who wants to buy a pass or a, a season pass or a 20 punch pass. Any questions about the revenue graphs? Uh, I, well, I am just curious, and maybe I'm misremembering this, but I feel like there was maybe a time when MCCSC started back, but the pool could, Brian was still open in the afternoon or the weekends, like after school hours or the weekends, or um, was that That was a before thing? my, uh, before I started managing those facilities. Yeah, I can jump in here. There, there was a time, but as you know, we've really track data on that and it's my recollection that there was um, a, a season or two where we had after school hours and then weekends and again the data just showed that our costs were far exceeding the numbers of people that were uh, taking advantage of those after school hours so now we're down to um, after school hours which are Friday Saturday and Sunday and okay. that seems to you know we've just tightened up um, yeah that and and have good numbers but that y you are right okay I we just had a lot and then we yeah because when I saw I mean I know when school starts obviously but when I saw the July 31st date I was thinking oh my gosh August is such a hot month for people to swim but if they're back in school then yeah mm -hmm. so okay and, and also what figures into that too is we begin to lose lifeguard staff I, as yeah. they return to you know what their fall schedules are so it's kind of a, a combination but again very grounded in in data okay thank you thank you Paul Next revenue line that I would like to address is the concessions revenue line at Bryan Park Pool. Um, we have two areas. We have the, the two lines of revenue, and our total revenue for 2022 um, was 42,794 and some change, and that exceeded 2021 by you know approximately $3,000. Um, so it's pretty consistent, it, it really, across the board. Depends on how hot it is, how many days we have rain. Um, those all factor into every one of these revenue lines. Okay. All right. Next. Mills Pool was pretty consistent uh, with 2021. Um, like I stated earlier today, really what bumped that revenue line up to almost $28,000 was uh, the extra camp time that we had at uh, Mills. So consistently it's, it's averaging about $25,000 uh, in revenue a year. Any questions on the aquatics report? Any questions for Dee? Okay, thank right. you. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, and then, um, so we have no other reports in that section. We'll move over to section E, public comment. Do we have any uh, members of the public who would like to make a comment? If so, you can come up to the podium. Or do we have anyone online? Mm -hmm. We do, but there's no hands raised. If anyone would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. No, okay. Oh, yes, come on up. Okay. Hi, my name is Anna Oresco, and I actually don't love public speaking. I just want to thank you so much. We spent time with Steve Cotter over the last week, and I cried quickly because I'm just so thankful. Being here as a parent and seeing all that you offer, it's just so encouraging. I'm thankful to live here. Um, I'm thankful for your expertise and what you offer. Just know like, the work you do is so appreciated. Um, and to have my students here represent us, it just it like breathes life into me in a way that you guys were able to give me, and I, I just can't thank you enough. So hopefully we do you proud with Butler Park, and if we don't, we'll try again. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice shout out to Steve Cotter, too. 
Okay, all right, and then uh, Paula, back over to you. Great, uh, my only comment is thank you again for your support and uh, good questions and conversation and, and thanks to Dee and her staff. As you know, it's a big sigh of relief to get through aquatic season and we had a great summer and I just wanna you know put that around our data on that when we have a good hot summer. Um, I think we were closed very minimal days and so it, it, was, it was great that way. So shout out there as we head into fall and holiday um, programs. And our next Park Board meeting is November 15th. Again, um, moved up a little bit because of the holiday. So um, please look over the price schedule. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know and I will get you those answers and we'll bring that back to you in November for final approval. Okay. All right, thank you. With that, I'll adjourn the October meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. <laughs>